Hello and welcome back to the videos of the reading aloud of the Siddhipadana uh, Vipassana talk given by the Venerable Mahasi Sahara. And today this is going to be the last um, this is going to be the last video because we're going to be finishing off today with washing and eating and we're going to be continuing on from where we left, left off at the last episode or the previous video where we just ended off with uh, sleep and waking and so today we are going to be finishing off strong with washing and eating and then we're going to have a summary of the essential points which is always nice to remember what we just went through and maybe we'll get to hear a little bit about the author as well and we'll see how much time we have left uh, when we're done reading um, the actual talk given and so without making too much of a fuzz and uh, dragging out the intro too much I think we should get on with the text and so continuing on with the last episode of this series which is going to be on the Satipatthana Vipassana and what a lovely day to be finishing off so today is the that's the 3rd of October on a Monday in 2016 and that's pretty much it. I think we're, we're ready to finish off strong and we still have the Buddha over here just up on the altar and picture there and some windows and some light. You can see that one getting some light from the sun and then we can turn it off or <laughs> we can turn it on and use the energy when the night time comes on and so get into a comfortable position and get ready to listen attentively and here we go Washing and eating. Contemplation should be carried out in washing the face in the morning or when taking a bath, as it is necessary to act quickly in such instances due to the nature of the action itself. Contemplation should be carried out as far as these circumstances will allow. On stretching the hand to catch hold of the dipper, it should be noted as stretching, stretching. On catching a hold of the dipper, as holding, holding. On immersing the dipper, as dipping, dipping. On bringing the dipper towards the body, as bringing, bringing. On pouring the water over the body, or on the face as pouring, pouring, on feeling cold as cold, cold, on rubbing as rubbing, rubbing, and so forth. There are also many different bodily actions in changing or arranging one's clothing in arranging the bed or bed sheets, in opening the door and so on. These actions should be contemplated in detail, serially, as much as possible. At the time of taking a meal, contemplation should begin from the moment of looking at the table and note it as looking, seeing, looking, 
seeing when stretching the hand to the plate as stretching, stretching. When the hand touches the food as touching, touching. And hot, hot. When the food, uh, when gathering the food as gathering, gathering. When catching hold of the food as catching, catching. After lifting, when the hand is being brought up as bringing, bringing. When the neck is bent down as bending, bending. When the food is being placed in the mouth as placing, placing. When withdrawing, when withdrawing the hand as withdrawing, withdrawing. When the hand touches the plate as touching, touching. And when the neck is straightened as straightening, straightening. When chewing the food as chewing, chewing. And while, while tasting the food as tasting, tasting. When one likes the taste as liking, liking. When one finds it pleasant as pleasant, pleasant. And when swallowing as swallowing, swallowing. This is an illustra this is an illustration of the routine of contemplation on partaking of eat morsel of food till the meal is finished. In this case in this case too, it is difficult to follow up on all actions at the beginning of the practice. There will be many omissions. Uh, yogis should not hesitate, however, but must try to follow up as best as they can. With the gradual advancement of the practice, it will become easier to note many more objects than are mentioned here. The instructions for the practical exercise of contemplation are now almost complete, as they have been explained in detail and at some length. It will not be easy to remember all of them. And for the sake of easy remembrance, a short summary of some of the important and essential points will now be given. Summary of Essential Points In walking, a meditator should contemplate the movements of each step while one is walking briskly, each step should be noted as right step, left step, respectively. The mind should be fixed intently on the sole of the foot in the movements of each step. While one is in the course of walking slowly, each step should be noted in two parts as lifting, placing. While one is in a sitting posture, the usual exercise of contemplation should be carried out by noting the movements of the abdomen as rising, falling, rising, and falling. The same manner of contemplation by noting the movements as rising, falling, rising, falling, should be carried out while one is also in the lying posture. If it is found that the mind wanders during the course of noting rising, falling, 
that you'd not be allowed to continue to wander, but should be noted immediately. On imagining on imagining it should be noted as imagining imagining on thinking as thinking thinking on the mind going out as going going on the mind arriving at a place as arriving arriving and so forth at every occurrence and then the usual exercise of noting rising and falling should be continued. When there occur when there occur feelings of tiredness in the hands, legs or other limbs, or hot, prickly, aching or itching sensations, they should be immediately followed up and noted as Tired, hot, prickly, aching, itching, and so on, as the case may be. A return should then be made to the usual exercise of noting rising, falling. When there are acts of bending or stretching the hands or legs, or moving the neck or limbs, or swaying in the body, to and from. They should be followed up and noted in serial order as they occur. The usual exercise of noting as rising, falling, should then be reverted to. This is only a summary. Any other objects to be contemplated in the course of training will be mentioned by the meditation teachers when giving instructions during the daily interview with the disciples. If one proceeds with the practice in the, man in the manner indicated, the number of objects will gradually increase in the course of time. At first, there will be many omissions because the mind is used to wandering without any restraint whatsoever. However, a meditator should not lose heart on this account. This difficulty is usually encountered in the beginning of practice. After some time, the mind can no longer play truant and because it is always found out every time it wanders, Okay, I'm going to read that one again, because I didn't get the context right. After some time, the mind can no longer play truant, because it is always found out every time it wanders. It therefore remains fixed on the object to which it is directed. As rising occurs, the mind makes a note of it, and thus the object and the mind coincident coincide as falling as falling occurs the mind makes a note of it and thus the object and the mind coincide this always appear the object and the mind which knows the object at each time of noting these two elements of the material object and the knowing mind always arise in pairs and apart from these two, there does not exist any other thing in the form of a person or self. This reality will be personally realized in due course. The fact that materiality and mentality are two distinct, separate things will be clearly, clearly perceived during the time of noting rising and falling. The two elements of materiality and mentality are linked up in pairs and their arising coincides, and that is, 
the process of materiality in rising arises with the process of mentality which knows it. In the process of materiality in falling, the process, wait a minute, the process of materiality in falling falls away together with the process of mentality which knows it. It is the same for lifting, moving and placing. These are processes of materiality arising and falling away together with the processes of mentality which knows them. This knowledge in respect of matter and mind rising separately is known as Nama Rupa Parichetta Jnana. The discriminating knowledge of mentality materiality it is the preliminary stage in the whole course of insight knowledge it is important to have this preliminary stage developed in a proper manner on continuing the practice of contemplation for some time there will be considerable progress in mindfulness and concentration. At this high level it will be perceptible that on every occasion of noting each process arises and passes away at that very moment. But on the other hand uninstructed people generally consider that the body and mind remain in a permanent state throughout life. That the same body of childhood has grown up into adulthood, that the same young mind has grown up into maturity, and that both body and mind are one and the same person. In reality, this is not so. Nothing is permanent. Everything comes into existence for a moment and then passes away. Nothing can remain for even the blink of an eye. Changes are taking place very swiftly and they will be perceived in due course. While carrying on the contemplation by noting rising and falling and so forth, one will perceive that these, process these processes arise and pass away one after another in quick succession. On perceiving that everything passes away, at the very point noting, a meditator knows that nothing is permanent. This knowledge regarding the impermanent nature of things is anicca nupassana jnana. The contemplative knowledge of impermanence A meditator, a meditator then knows that this ever-changing state of things is distressing and is not to be desired. This dukkha nupassana jnana, the, contempl the contemplative knowledge of suffering, on suffering many painful feelings, this body and mind complex is regarded as a mere heap of suffering. This is also contemplative knowledge of suffering. It is then perceived that the elements of materiality and mentality never follows one's wish, but arise according to their own nature and conditioning. While being engaged in the act of noting these processes, a meditator understands that these processes are not controllable and they are neither a person, nor a living entity, nor self. This is anatta, anatta nupassana jnana, the contemplative knowledge of non-self. When a meditator has fully developed the knowledge of impermanence, suffering and non-self, he will realize Nibbana. From 
from time, immemorial Buddhas, Arahats and Aryas, the noble ones, have realized Nibbana by this method of Vipassana. It is the highway leading to Nibbana. Vipassana consists of the four Satipatthana, applications of mindfulness, and it is Satipatthana, which is really the highway to Nibbana. Meditators who take up this course of training should bear in mind that they are on the highway which has been taken by Buddhas, Arahats and Aryas. This opportunity is afforded them So I'm a little bit um, distracted in my reading and I didn't really understand what this line said. So I had to read it silently in my own mind. And now I'm going to read it aloud. This opportunity is afforded them apparently because of their parami, that is, their previous endeavors in seeking and wishing for it and also because of their present mature conditions. They should rejoice at the, at the heart for having this opportunity. They should also feel assured that by walking on this highway without wavering, they will gain personal experience of highly developed concentration and wisdom as has been known by Buddhas, Arahats and Aryas. They will develop such a pure state of concentration as has never been known before in the course of their lives and thus enjoy many innocent pleasures as a result of advanced concentration. Impermanent suffering and non-self will be realized through direct personal experience and with the full development of these knowledges Nibbana will be realized. It will not, ta it will not take long to achieve the objective possibility. One month or twenty days or 15 days, or on rare occasions, even in 7 days for those select few with extraordinary parami, perfection. Yogis or meditators should therefore proceed with the practice of contemplation in great earnestness and with full confidence trusting that it will surely lead to the development of the noble path and fruit and to the realization of Nibbana. They will then be free from the wrong view of self and from spiritual doubt and they will no longer be subject to the round of rebirth in the miserable realms of the hells animal world and the sphere of petas. May, may meditators meet with every success in their noble endeavor. And that concludes the talk on the Satipatthana Vipassana as given by the Venerable Mahasi Sayada. And we have um, just about 10 minutes or eight minutes remaining on this video and so I thought it might be interesting to read this little passage here which is about the author it's not really that long but I think it would be nice to finish off um, this series with uh, hearing about the Venerable Mahasi Sayada and
that would be very interesting. So I think uh, I'm just going to read this as well. Let me just make sure it's not uh, just technical stuff. So it should be a little bit interesting. Okay. Okay, I think this is fine. Okay, so here we go. About the author. The Venerable Mahasi Sayado Yu Supana Mahatera was one of the most eminent meditation masters of modern times and a leader in the contemporary resurgence of Vipassana meditation. Born near Shwebo town in Burma in 1904, he was ordained a novice monk at the age of 12 and received full ordination as a bhikkhu at the age of 20. He quickly distinguished himself as a scholar of the, of the Buddhist scriptures and by his fifth year of the full ordination was himself teaching the scriptures at a monastery in Mole Mine. In the eight, in the eighth year after ordination, he left Mole Mine uh, seeking a clear and effective method in the practice of meditation. At Taton, he met the well-known meditator instructor, the Venerable Yu Narada, also known as the Mingun Jitawun Sayadaw. He then placed him himself under the guidance of the Sayadaw and underwent, underwent intensive training in Vipassana meditation. In 1941, he returned to his native village and introduced the systematic practice of Vipassana meditation to the era, area. Many people, monks as well as layman, laymen, took up the practice and greatly benefited by his careful instructions. In 1949, the then Prime Minister of Burma, Yu Nu, and Sir Twin, Executive members of the Buddha Sasana Nugaha Association invited the Venerable Mahasi Sayadaw to come to Rangoon to give training in meditation practice. He assented to their request and took up residence at the Tatana Yik Yikta Meditation Center where he continued to conduct intensive courses in Vipassana meditation until his death in 1982. Under his guidance, thousands of people have been trained at his center and many more have benefited from his clear-cut approach to meditation practice through his writings and the teachings of his disciples. More than a hundred branch centers of the Tatana Yikta Center have been established in Burma and his method has spread widely to other countries, east and west. Venerable Mahas Sayada also holds Burma's highest scholastic honor, uh, the title of Akka Mahapantita awarded to him in 1952 during the 6th during the 6th mm, that's a hard word during the 6th buddhist council held in rangoon from 1954 to 1956 he performed the duties of questioner puchaka a role performed at the first buddhist council by the venerable mahakasapa Venerable Mahasi Sayada was also a member of the executive, commi executive committee that was responsible as the final authority for the codification of all the texts edited at the council. Venerable Mahasi Sayada is the author of numerous works on both meditation and the Buddhist scriptures in his native Burmese. His discourses on Buddhist suttas have been translated into English 
and are published by the Buddha Sasana Nugaha Association. And that concludes the final uh, chapter or the final little passage on the notes about the author. And so this is going to be the sixth and final video in this series of meditation videos here at the meditation spot of the white room. And I hope this was of some benefit and um, make sure to check out the text yourself if you're interested. And I hope that if you've seen all of these videos, all six parts, it was very cool of you to hang out with me for so long and May you find true peace, happiness, and freedom from suffering. And we can use the last few minutes and just do some meditation. And then we can dedicate the merit of our mindful moments together. Right now, you and I, to all beings on all planes all of them in existence and today is also the birthday of a good friend of mine and the wedding day of my parents so I would like to dedicate the merit of this six part series to my parents and to my friends and to everyone I know and to my teachers and to all beings in existence. And now let's meditate for about one minute and that's going to be the conclusive part, the last few moments of this series. And once again, thank you so much. And may your meditation always be peaceful and fruitful.